Welcome to the college. Thank you so much for coming to talk to us today. Let's start by talking about your childhood, which took place in South Africa to begin with, I believe. Well, um, although I was born in South Africa, um, my family moved when I was about three to Swaziland. We walked up Kilimanjaro, we went to the Ngora Gora Crater and did a all around Lake Victoria. It was a fantastic childhood. And what made you decide to study medicine? Well, I guess it always tagged along with my father for to all the district clinics and hospitals and so on and helped him. So I sort of fell into it really without thinking about it. I went to university in Johannesburg. Um, I did a medical BSc initially in, in physiology and anthropology. Did you start your anaesthetic career there or when you got to Australia? Yes, when I, once I decided to emigrate after being conscripted into the military, um, I wanted something that was dynamic physiology and pharmacology, but that would also give me a living. Mm -hmm. And I started uh, anaesthesia at King Edwards, which was which was fantastic experience. Which was one of the very big hospitals. Yeah, you? about 3,500 beds. And we used to run three operating theatres for each anaesthetist. So you'd usually have one under regional block, one under spinal, uh, unsedated, and then one GA. Um, my record for supraclavicular brachial plexus blocks was 14 in 30 minutes with a string of patients sitting down in chairs followed by a couple of ulnar nerve blocks and then you went on. So did you complete your whole specialist training there? No, I went, once I got the primary and sufficient money together applied to Canada and Australia and my Australian application came through first. I arrived in Adelaide and went to work uh, the first day at the Royal Adelaide Hospital and rotated through the teaching hospitals and then I was invited uh, to be a star specialist at the brand new Flinders Medical Centre in 1976. You've concentrated a lot on safety, I guess that's where your research has been focused. I ended up publishing about 20 papers evaluating equipment and, and showing that there was a big gap between what people thought they were doing and what they were actually measuring in the wards. That led me to thinking about um, risk and safety in patients and, and what the benefits and costs of various procedures were. So I woke up very frustrated by this one morning and I literally that morning before getting out of bed decided that I would call up influential anaesthetists and organise a meeting and set anaesthesia standards. So I rang 65 anaesthetists around the country. We had 35 talks, each of which the people produced a manuscript and we published a symposium issue of anaesthesia and intensive care. And out of that three things came um, the first thing was that we, we, we proposed anaesthesia standards, which included pulse oximetry for every patient. The second thing was we formed the Australian Patient Safety Foundation, which turned out to be the first national all of health patient safety body in the world by more than a decade. The third thing that came out of that meeting was uh, what came to be known as AIMS, or the Australian Incident Monitoring Study. All of this took you outside of anaesthesia. I mean, you, you started with anaesthesia mm. safety and it very quickly spread outside of that realm. In the uh, mid-90s, I was invited to be part of what became known as the Quality in Australian Healthcare Study, which is a retrospective analysis of 14,000 medical records looking for things that went wrong in healthcare. Now, what that paper showed was that anaesthesia uh, was ac accounted for only 2% of things that go wrong and harm patients in hospitals. Mm. Surgery nearly 50%. So clearly if the Australian Patient Safety Foundation was going to interest itself with improving patient safety across healthcare, we had to broaden our mm. horizons. So what you started was an incident monitoring service, which was a very different thing really, looking at near misses and, and a much bigger, broader range of incidents. Tell us about what happened with that when you started it and what you were aiming for. The fundamental difference between adverse event studies, mortality studies, and incident reporting is that the former are really counting things that go wrong. The latter, the incident reporting, you can't count, but you can understand. Mm. And if you can understand what's going wrong and why the things are going wrong, you're in a position to develop corrective strategies. And indeed, that original AIMS 2000 
uh, analysis uh, pointed out the enormous uh, power of oximetry and capnography and influenced world standards and other standards since. Now, let's just go back a bit. At the start of all of this, you and Jeff Cooper, I think, had quite a bit to do with the way pilots manage things and that the pilots really had better ways of checking things than we did at that stage. First of all, the, the reporting in aviation is, is much better, the understanding of what goes wrong. And second of all, the, 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 the mechanisms for dealing with them. They, they will respond, redesign things. The whole standardised cockpit layout came out of the critical incident reporting method. So uh, out of this came a meeting in Ballarat in, I think, 1987, mm -hmm. in which I invited um, anaesthetists to present how they would manage crises. And, um, I invited aviation, civil aviation psychologists to come to the meeting and it absolutely terrified the, the pilots and the aviation psychologists who were there that, that these people had no standardised approach to these life-threatening crises which had to be dealt with in a very short time span. We subsequently published 26 papers of, uh, of, of algorithms and sub-algorithms for every type of anaesthetic crisis. And how much do you think they have changed practice? How much do you think they've actually penetrated what we do? Not as much as I would like. Um, recently, uh, a study done at Harvard, again, Jeff Cooper's simulation group, um, have shown quite conclusively that working from checklists or pre-compiled responses in crises is far better mm. than working from first principles. Something, I guess, which I thought was intuitively obvious 25 years ago. Uh, and, and aviation ha has it as its standard practice. But it still hasn't, doesn't seem to have become as mainstream as I think it should be in healthcare. Bill, there is a certain reluctance among the medical profession to accept this sort of protocol-driven management. Why do you think that is? We've recently published a paper, a, a big study on appropriateness of care, uh, which showed that adult Australians get appropriate care at only 57% of all healthcare encounters for 22 common conditions. And we now have an NHMRC program ground addressing exactly this question, seeing what works and what doesn't work in trying to change people's behaviour. It is interesting because that study that you've done is focused on guidelines that are set on different levels of evidence. Mm. And, and then you'll get people arguing about the evidence and saying, well, that doesn't work in my practice. We have, we have the same issue with all the guidelines being published around anaesthesia that, well, that's all very well, but in my particular practice, that's not going to work yeah. for the following reasons. The arguments in, in medicine, I think, are quite underdeveloped compared with other industries. If you look, for example, at aviation, it's now accepted that for things that are straightforward uh, and for things that people are bad at, like vigilance and like checking, that proceduralisation is a given. Mm. Um, proceduralise where you can and should proceduralise. And don't argue and say it's individual and complicated and difficult. It doesn't mean that that paralyzes you and prevents you from, from, from having uh, context-dependent responses when mm. appropriate. And, and you therefore have to behave like you're flying a hang glider or a, or a microlight. You've got to do it yourself. And I think those skills in anaesthetists, I think, are enormously important. And because um, a lot of anaesthesia is a bit like flying in, in bad weather. Uh, you really want the anaesthetist to be able to be in control of, of multiple variables when things go bad, just like you want the pilot to be able to do. Now, while we're on the subject of microlights, one thing I've never understood, Bill, is that your life has been around safety and your recreational life is far from that. <laughs> so why do I fly microlights? I think, really, uh, with people like Leonardo da Vinci and, and other people, who would have loved to have flown? Yes. I think we have a responsibility to do it. <laughs> And a lot of it does come down to human factors. There was an incident in your life where you realised that, uh, that human factors were having a part in the way you remembered things. Yes, I used to be a very fanatical windsurfer and um, I used to buy new sails every year in Singapore, bring them back to Australia. This occasion I bought a nice big 7.6 metre race sail. So I launched in the, through the surf with this mighty sail and took off like a rocket and was concentrating on hooking into my harness when I looked up and there was a catamaran which I speared through one hull, flew like Batman into the air and uh, surfaced to find the, um, the owner of the catamaran saying impolite things to me <laughs> with his children in the water. Anyway, I went back to the shore and having placated the man and offered to uh, rent him a Hobie cat, um, I started sailing again and 
I said the winds turned 180 degrees because I had created a scenario in my brain, which I can remember to this day, of how I was unsighted. The, the luff of the sail yep. had hidden this catamaran from me. In actual fact, when I looked at the wind direction, it was in full vision. And to this day, I can't imagine what actually happened. And I think it's enormously important because it really casts doubt on all these witness statements you see in, in criminal courts. In my instance, no one is actually hurt, and yet I had switched the whatever happened to a favourable version to me within seconds of it happening. So I published this little editorial called Complete Retrograde Dyssinesia, or False Memory. So what do you think the lesson is from that? I mean, what should we do if we have a critical incident and everybody in the room is going to have a different memory of it? Yes, I mean, and particularly if someone's harmed. The lesson, it's not an easy one. I mean, I think this is the advantage of videotaping trauma resuscitations as Mackenzie has done in the States. You learn an enormous amount because what you think you did and what you think happened is different. So what we're proposing now in response to our appropriateness study, it's, I'm calling it ABC sets, Agreed Basic Care Standardised Electronic Tools. That We have a wiki-based process. We come up with clinical standards for basic care for all common conditions and procedures. So why is this important, Bill? Well, it's important because we are on the cusp of, of a revolution and I think the way healthcare will be practiced in the near future will look totally different to the way it has in the past. There's right. a long way to go, but there are also enormous benefits in healthcare which will remain unrealised and out of the reach of many people unless we stop practising inappropriate care. So when we sum up your career, what do you think have been the biggest changes in anaesthesia that you've witnessed or been part of in in the last few decades? Above all, I think the consumer experience, the patient having an anaesthetic. Um, I had an ether anaesthetic, I know that you did, we both remember them to this day as being intensely unpleasant experiences. Whereas having had a bunch of anaesthetics, I think I had 16 procedures last year for detached retinas um, and things like hip replacements, I can honestly say that um, the anaesthesia side of it is, is uh, exceptionally well developed mm -hmm. and uh, all you ever know about it is you go along and talk to a colleague and the next thing you're, you're in the recovery ward. Yes. So anaesthesia is largely a success story. True. Bill, thank you so much for coming to talk to us today. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you about your career and all that you're still doing currently. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for having me. <laughs>